Ladies and gentlemen, we'll start again. Please come back in the room and take your seats. If we can run the gong again. Thank you. Please all come back. This is starting again. So we are now in the middle of the second part of the Evital session, and I'm inviting on stage uh, the next presenter, Richard Brown from Sulfrodyne Aerospace, for a presentation on the vortex ring states and the consideration for Evital aircraft. Well, thanks everybody for coming. It's, uh, it's a choice between several events here, so I do appreciate it very much. What I'm going to do is to take you back about 22 years to the 18th of April 2000 in Marana in Texas, in Arizona, sorry, when three V-22 aircraft, which are just, just, just about to be brought into service, were flying in formation at night with all the pilots on night vision goggles busy simulating a tactical descent into a desert airfield. As often happens in these particular circumstances, what happened is the lead aircraft felt it was about to overshoot the landing area and came down too early. The aircraft just behind saw this happening in the night vision goggles. The, the pilot pulled back on his cyclic stick, entered a higher rate of descent than he'd appreciated, and within seconds it turned over, crashed onto the desert floor, killing himself and the other 18 folk on board. And that was probably the day in which a rather obscure phenomenon within rotorcraft aerodynamics re-entered the, 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 the mind, if you like, of aircraft designers. And since then, well, and in, in particular, the idea that this particular state that the aircraft had got into, got into, called the vortex ring state, might actually pose a fundamental problem to the safety of helicopters. So in the last 22 years, what have we actually learned and what can we actually apply to this whole new area of aviation that we're about to be exposed to in the name of eVTOL aircraft? Well, the first thing we know from a physical point of view, and I'm going to sort of jump between the physics where I feel very comfortable and perhaps the operational side of things where I'm sure I can get a lot of advice and, and, and some good questions from you folk. But for, for a physical uh, background, we know, for example, that a rotor wake in level flight, here's a rotor, generates the cylindrical wake. And that cylindrical wake tends to stream down underneath the aircraft and behind and back. What's perhaps not well appreciated is that wake is actually very unstable. And it tends to leave that cylindrical structure behind after a short distance, ending up in this highly turbulent mess of, of structure. Now, as you increase the, the descent rate of the aircraft, something very strange happens in that that cylindrical structure suddenly swaps into this toroidal vortex ring structure like that, in which most of the vortex actually ends up streaming up behind the helicopter still, but in this highly congested, chaotic form. Now, that's, that's talking very physically. That's talking in terms of the fluid mechanics. If we talk in terms of piloting, then really what we see from a piloting perspective is either something like thrust and power fluctuations, reversal of the control derivatives, so for example, thrust versus collective pitch, or if you're a V22 expert, then you'll see something like this diagram over here, which tries to show on a diagram of forward speed on the horizontal axis versus vertical speed on the vertical axis, a region within the descending part of the flight envelope in which something crazy happens. Here, excessive activity on the automatic flight control system that governs the lateral control of the vehicle. Okay, so that's from a piloting point of view. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail of the physics of the numerical methods that we use. Uh, you can go along to our website, and there's a lot of information on that. But really, the, the kind of thing we've learned over the last 22 years is that you, what you get out is what you put in. And you need some very, very sophisticated techniques which are capable of modeling the developing wake structure to be able to expose these effects in the dynamics of, um, or the aerodynamics of the vehicle. OK, so we can go to full-scale simulations of the entire aircraft if we really want to. So that's asymmetric vortex ring state developing on a six-rotted fancy, uh, some form of, of EVTOL EV aircraft. But that often doesn't really give us much physical insight into what's going on in the problem. It's just too complicated. There are far too many things going on there. 
So what we tend to do is we tend to resort to some very, very simple models. We start with just a rotor in isolation and try and model that's physics. And you can see in that top diagram there, that's a, a rotor wake busy developing below a very simple rotor system. And you can see this idea of this initially cylindrical rotor wake demolishing itself as, as the result of the action of these inherent vortex instabilities. Now that gives rise to, to a bit of thought. You sit down and you think, okay, what's the actual basic physics here? Can we extrapolate that to end up with a model which you can actually use in design of the vehicles rather than as the long end game of, 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 of several days of simulation on the biggest, fattest computer that you can find? And what we realized quite early on is that there's something wrong with the fundamental description of the physics of the vortex ring state. It's not this idea that you see in the textbooks or in the flight manuals of the aircraft descending into its own wake. It's a fundamental phenomenon related to the instability of the rotor wake. These instabilities can grow in space and they can convect down into the, into the flow behind the vehicle. And really what's happening is once the aircraft goes into vortex ring state, is it's actually these instabilities catching up with the helicopter rotor. It's not the wake itself. And if you take that physical viewpoint, you can end up with something really, really interesting, which is a, is a well, let me first show you this in a, in a brief fashion to try and elaborate. What I'm really trying to show you here is, first of all, on, on this side over here, computational simulation of the growth of the wake. There's the nice tube, and here's all the chaos. This is the representation in terms of the growth of these instabilities. Uh, this is the kind of uh, torque variation that you would see on, this, on the system of the power variation as you increase the descent rate. So look what happens as I try to increase the descent rate. You can see what's happening is it's actually those instabilities that are catching up with the rotor, not the rotor doing anything, uh, not descending through its own wake. There the instabilities catch up, if you like, with the, with the rotor, and then a little bit later the wake collapses, poof, into this uh, toroidal form, which we know as the vortex ring state. Okay, so that's the physics of what's going on. And we can extrapolate that physics into a nice numerical model. This is a back of the envelope kind of thing, which allows you to map out on the flight regime, written in terms of forward speed and vertical speed, the region of that envelope where the aircraft would be susceptible to the vortex ring state. Now don't get too hung up on the mathematics here. What you might recognize in both of those equations is an equation that of something that looks something like an ellipse. And we know that when you look at an ellipse equation, this term over at the back end over here is the radius of the ellipse. And the interesting thing is when you do the mathematics, you find that the radius of that ellipse scales with the thrust coefficient of the rotor. And we know that the thrust coefficient scales with the disk loading of the system, or they're intimately related. And this is going to turn out to be the absolutely crucial point, this relationship to the disk loading. So how does it compare? How does that model compare to, to, to data out there? And there's a lot of data out there. Some of it really, really ancient and some of it more modern. And if I plot that that this VRS onset boundary on these axes over here, and you'll notice I've done something rather interesting. I've scaled those axes by the, 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 the induced velocity created by the rotor when in hover, or at least a simple theoretical model for that. And what that does is it effectively keeps the vortex ring lobe the same size, whereas everything else kind of changes, if you like. And I'll show you that in, in a little bit more specific detail later. And you can see the match between, between reality and and the model is, is relatively good. Bear in mind that this is a very generic model. If you're doing the vortex ring analysis for a Joby or you're doing it for a V22 or you're doing it for a EH101, you have to go and you have to replace this model with the specific vortex ring envelope for that particular aircraft. But you'll see this presentation is gonna be quite generic in that respect and, and hence, hence I'm gonna use this model throughout. Okay, so let's get down to basics. I've given you a basic outline of the physics. So we know that vortex ring state is a real threat to the helicopter community, as borne out by the accident statistics. So for example, if you go to the NTSB Carroll accident database, they, they, they're talking about 79 results for settling with power, which we now know is code for, for vortex ring state. And there's 17 which actually mention vortex state directly. And I've kind of almost in, in, uh, implied that already, that proper attention to the phenomenon is really obscured by a confusion over terminology and a basic lack of understanding of what's actually going on. So one of the things that I'd like to hopefully have you come out of this presentation with is a little bit better understanding of the vortex ring state itself. Now, the question is, as we go into this new domain of aeronautics, is the eVTOL community gonna make the same mistake? Are they also gonna end up in this confusion and, and maybe insist that the vortex ring state is not a particular problem or their particular aircraft is not particularly susceptible to that? Well, let's have a look at some of the issues which might have a bearing on that when you go about designing or, or, or your eVTOL or taking it into service. <laughs> 
And then, of course, seeing as we're here at the IASA conference, how can the regulators actually help the designers of these aircraft to achieve their aims? And I think this is a really, really important insight in that the designers and the regulators have to work hand in hand in a way. The one has to facilitate the other so that we can end up not just ending up down a rabbit hole where the technology becomes completely infeasible. That's the last thing I'd want you to take away from this presentation, that, that for some reason eVTOL aircraft are, are, not, are not viable because of, of some, some aerodynamic issue. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to kind of warm you up by talking a little, about, a little bit about trajectory effects. So in other words, how the trajectory followed by the aircraft might influence its susceptibility to the vortex ring state. I'll then talk about maneuvers and how details of the design of the aircraft might influence things. And then I'll concentrate a little bit on the urban environment uh, and, and talk in detail about that. Okay, one thing I'm not going to talk about, unfortunately, is aerodynamic interactions. This idea that you've got multi-rotor vehicles and the fluid dynamics of that interaction between those rotors can actually significantly influence the vortex ring characteristics of the vehicle. But again, if you go along to my website, there's a paper there which you can download, and it's talked about in, in more than a little detail. Okay, so this is, we're back to the, the physics. Here's the model, just to recap. It sits on the flight domain as defined in terms of forward speed and vertical speed, and Throughout the presentation, I'm going to present things in non-dimensional form by dividing the forward speed and the vertical speed by this disk loading parameter, VH, which is a fact, in fact the induced velocity in hover, which we know varies with the square root of the disk loading. So the bigger the disk loading, the bigger the induced velocity, the bigger the vortex ring domain is the, is the real takeaway over here. Okay, to, to, to really press that home. Here are the vortex ring envelopes mapped onto the flight envelopes for two particular aircraft that you might be familiar with. On the left-hand side there, that's the CH-53E, and on the right-hand side, that's the military version of the, of the Jet Ranger. And you can, if you go to the flight envelope, things look very similar, but if you look at those axes there, the, the, the scaling of the axes is very, very different. But encapsulated into the flight manuals is this idea of scaling by the disk loading. Because if I take this uh, right-hand diagram, and through the wonders of PowerPoint, I tried to map it across onto the other one. Whoops, well, okay, I'm a, hopefully a better aerodynamicist than a PowerPointer. But uh, you can see the relative sizes of those, those particular domains. So the smaller, lighter, light, more lightly loaded uh, Jet Ranger has a much smaller VRS domain, and it sits in a not quite as different part of the flight envelope as, as shown there. But you can see it's up and, and to, the, to the left. Okay, now, how, what is the dependence of, on disk loading for typical helicopters? Well, this is the trend shown over here. Now, uh, Luca's presentation earlier was, was interesting because what he shows is this progression of, of design through the last 70 years odd, but not much of a progression in some cases, and if you talk about conventional helicopters, in terms of configurational change. Configurational change is a much later concept. And so all these helicopters tend to lie in a trend like that if I plot the weight versus the disk loading. So at the bottom end there, you've got the good old Robinson R22. At the top end there, you've got the CH-53. And as a bit of an outlier that perhaps should have acted as a warning to us in the first place, there's the V-22 way out above the, the conventional curve, as you might expect. Now, if I stick on e the collection of eVTOL aircraft that I possibly could onto that diagram, this is the sort of thing that you tend to see. eVTOL aircraft are fundamentally different, is what this diagram is telling us here. They have lower weight in general than most helicopters, but a very much higher disk loading. If you dig away at that diagram in a little bit more detail, you can really pick out three different classes. Up at the top here, you've got the direct jet lift type aircraft, and that's not the one that you might expect it actually is. Over here, you've got the, the aircraft which are very helicopter-like in their configuration, as you might expect. The ones that I'm going to concentrate are these ones in the middle here, in the sort of red area, which are really the, the um, lift and cruise or the vector thrust type, type vehicles that, that we perhaps would most associate with, with eVTOL aircraft. The problem is it's very difficult to, to actually find data. I should have 300 points on there, and I've only got however many it is, six. Okay, now those are representative VRS boundaries for typical helicopters, the R22 at the top and the V22 down at the bottom. And you can, you can pick out the numbers there and you can, for your favorite aircraft, and you can see that those figures are, are roughly the kind of figures that you'd, you'd imagine. Now, this is the interesting thing. If I take some of those eVTOL aircraft, one, two, and three in that diagram there, and plot them on the same axes, you see something really, really interesting, that because of their very high disk loading, they have VRS, the, the part of the flight envelope that's influenced by VRS, in the case of the one in particular there, is about as big as that for the CH-53, if not for the V-22. So how is this going to influence their, their behavior in, in reality? 
Okay, so let's talk about trajectory just as a warm-up. So this is the kind of thing that I'm going to show you here. This is the same old diagram again with the VRS regime in non-dimensional fashion. And I'm going to put something which I'm going to call the intended trajectory on that particular figure there. We know that the aircraft is not going to follow that intended trajectory once it meets the vortex ring state. It's going to follow some sort of escape trajectory. But let's treat this as a somewhat of an ideal situation. OK, so another thing to realize is that if I use this non-dimensionalized presentation, things scale very interestingly as I change the disk loading of the, of the aircraft. The VRS domain stays in the same place on this non-dimensional representation, but the trajectories scale by shrinking and expanding with respect to the origin. In other words, angles are preserved, but, but locations on the diagram are not, are not preserved. What that means is that an aircraft with a higher disk loading will have this trajectory which is like squeezed in towards the, the origin, whereas one with a lower disk loading will have it pushed out. So, Let's take one trajectory as, a, as an example. So, so there, that I've, I've selected a trajectory which is a fairly, fairly benign descent. And you can see that all the helicopter designs that I've selected there lie well outside the VRS regime throughout their trajectory. The interesting thing that happens, though, is when I add the, the eVTOL aircraft on there, the trajectories tend to lie to the, to the left and are squeezed in to the extent that you can see that the margins with respect to the VRS onset boundary are, are, are in all cases reduced. If I push up the descent rate at the middle of the trajectory, then you can see that things get even worse. And that, okay, I should remark that that's a trajectory that the helicopters might still wish to follow if, if let's say, they were pushed for, for time or for, for trying to get out the sky in a, in a hurry. This trajectory over here is perhaps unrealistic. Even a helicopter pilot would not try to fly something like that on purpose, obviously, because it encroaches so much into the vortex ring domain. The, the reason I put that trajectory up there is because there's pressure from the regulatory environment, if you like, in terms of defining heliports, which might force eVTOL aircraft to fly trajectories like this. In which case, there are definitely going to be problems as far as VRS is concerned, if proper cognizance of that, of that dynamic is not taken into account. Okay, so these are the conclusions from here. eVTOL disk load is generally not high enough to exploit a favorable shift in the VRS boundary, which occurs because of the increase in, in disk loading. And the trajectories that tend to be safe for helicopters tend to be less so for eVTOL aircraft in general. And, and so, especially in the urban environment, we need to be a little bit careful how we handle the prescription of the trajectories that these vehicles are going to be allowed to follow. And I'll talk a bit about that in more detail. Now, things get really interesting once we add a little bit of complexity to the, to the situation, where we start to say, OK, it's not really the trajectory of the aircraft that matters. It's the trajectory of the rotors themselves. So, OK, let's say we've got something like a tilt rotor aircraft with, with rotors that are way out on the wings. What happens if we start to, do, to induce a roll rate or something like that onto the aircraft? And that's, that's, if you like, my first example. So I'm going to look at two examples, side-by-side -side rotors and vectored rotor thrust. In the case of side-by-side -side rotors, here's the interesting thing. The left and right rotors, if I institute a roll motion, something like that, follow independent or different trajectories to that of the aircraft itself. And on the downgoing rotor in this particular instance, it's quite likely that you might have an impingement on the vortex ring domain if your aircraft trajectory is taking you close enough to that domain in the first place. And the big issue here is the potential for asymmetric vortex ring state, where one rotor goes into vortex ring state, the other doesn't, and your control system is not properly configured to account for that particular uh, occurrence. The other situation that is of, of interest, for example, is if you have a nice sleek aircraft, which has a very nice low drag coefficient, as a lot of these aircraft are designed to have, but then you rely on the rotors to decelerate those aircraft from their cruise condition down into the hover condition and then into land. Now, what happens there, of course, is you can imagine these rotors, as they're tilting from their forward position to act as propellers, to perhaps tilt horizontal to act as, as lifting devices, to perhaps even tilt slightly backwards to act as decelerating devices, the, 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 just the basic uh, vector mechanics of that suggests that you might have an impingement into the vortex ring condition. And that's indeed the case if you do the analysis here. So these various parameters, per, these parametric curves over here, show how as you increase the aircraft drag, you actually become a little bit better as far as vortex ring impingement goes. But if you have a low drag configuration where you're relying on the rotors to decelerate yourself, you might have significant problems with, with vortex ring encounter if you don't design your trajectories to account for, for that. OK, so the conclusions there is that there are elements of eVTOL configurational design that can actually increase the chances of entering the VRS during descent and landing, mainly as a result of maneuvers and the coupling of the maneuvers and the, the vector mechanics of the flow field at the rotors.
and, and really, this is a point for the designers. Designers would really do very well to verify that the aircraft don't contain hidden failure modes in this respect. Now, as the last issue, what I'd like to look at is, is the urban environment in some detail, given where we are. The first thing we can do using this model, and I'm not going to go into the detail in terribly much uh, uh, time, um, because that's, this is well written up in, the, in, in my paper, but essentially what we can do is we can use this analytical definition of the vortex ring onset boundary to define a gust margin. So in other words, how far is your trajectory actually away from that vortex ring boundary? And you can use those two in analytic models, which I've written in, in mathematical, whoops, which is unintentional, which I've written over here as part of an optimization package to actually make sure that your trajectories get you as far away from that vortex ring onset boundary as you possibly can. Okay, so I don't want to cover that in too much detail, but if you look at those diagrams over there, hopefully they'll make sense to any, any helicopter pilot and then by inference through to, to eVTOL uh, operations as well. What I'd like to concentrate on in the last few minutes is the vertiport, vertiport design, especially in the context of the EASA FTS, uh, sorry, PTS VPT DSN uh, document that came out quite recently. The idea here being that uh, this is a rather nice picture, a man pushing his, his little baby in a, in a cart uh, along a road next to a, a, a VTOL port, which is protected from the remainder of the environment by a couple of bushes and a, and a little low fence. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's, let's take, tackle that from a physical point of view. Um, okay, this is the basics of, of, of the idea. It's effectively that the aircraft will descend into a, uh, within a, in, in a confined space, and the last stage of that confined space is essentially this funnel-shaped uh, structure in space into which the aircraft will descend and then, then come into land. Now, let's do the analysis of that particular situation over, over here. Here we can just change the geometry from one, from one situation to the other. So, this is the, the, the uh, physical domain, if you like, with some of the angles defining that box defined over there. And here I've mapped those particular angles onto the VRS, or at least the, the flight envelope, in terms of horizontal speed and vertical speed. So beta, the angle over there, is the angle that effectively defines, if you look over there, it's the angle of the shallowest allowable descent trajectory that you can actually adopt. So anything that goes into there is okay from a geometric point of view. The green bit's okay geometrically, but let's have a look and see if it's okay aerodynamically. We know that we have to follow some sort of trajectory then, which will take us to this point D, and then we'll descend along that path over there at some angle of descent until we reach zero, zero, which is stationary on the ground. Okay, so let's then move out a little bit and have a look at what happens once we put the VRS regime onto that boundary. And you can see that the presence of that VRS regime constrains what can happen inside that box from a physical point of view. It basically says that you can't descend within that box at anything greater than a certain descent rate. Because if you try to move that point D downwards, then what will happen? You'll enter into the, VTOR, the, the vortex ring state as you come into the box, and, and that's, that box is typically defined as something like 30 meters high, and if you're at 30 meters in vortex ring state, that's, that's not what you, what you want to happen. Okay, so what have you got available to you? You've got the entire design of the aircraft. Perhaps the most effective parameter to vary is the disc loading itself. So there we happen to sit at a particular disc loading. How can we actually increase our, our distance away from the vortex ring state boundary? Well, the easiest thing to do, of course, is to increase the disc loading, because we know that shrinks the trajectory towards the origin. So we do something like that, right? And that sounds like a very sensible way of proceeding. And uh, talking with, with some of the designers, that's, that's the kind of approach that these, these folk are thinking of adopting. The problem is, of course, is that uh, we've, we've not even talked about another particular physical problem, which is outwash effects. Um, we had recently had a problem in the United Kingdom where one of our US Marine friends decided to land at a local, uh, air, a local uh, hospital and on taking off uh, demolished the, the landing pad along with, uh, with any capability of future aircraft to land there for a few weeks. Now, the, the, the last thing we want is in our nice Parisian cafe to turn the Parisian cafe from a gentle, genteel uh, arrangement like that into something like a typhoon hit there and dispersed the chairs all the way down to the, the, the next uh, boulevard. So now what do we know here? We know that the strength of the wall jet is proportional to the disc loading. So the higher the disc loading of the aircraft, the higher the wall jet, the more the damage that happens to take place. We've also a significant amount of, of information from brownout studies. We, we've done a lot of work in terms of understanding just the configurational effects, how different configurations give you different patterns of outwash along the ground. If you go back to basics, there are two basic things that you need to remember. First of all, the outwash pattern is complex and configuration dependent, and some simple scaling laws apply. 
And the most important of those scaling laws is that the strength of the wall jet is proportional to the disk loading, and that the cumulative damage, which is perhaps the more important parameter, is proportional to the outwash velocity times time. So if you try to ameliorate your situation either by taking longer in the descent or using higher downwash velocities by design, you're both go, you're ending up the same, the same particular, particular problem in, in both particular cases. So what we end up seeing is a situation where we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. And this diagram, I hope, illustrates that fairly well. We've got the old vortex ring regime boundary, which I've drawn in over here. And there's our little green area, which we originally had. But there's also this outwash boundary, which constrains the descent rates from, from below. So in terms of our design, of where we actually put this point D, we're, as I said, between a rock and a hard place. We can't go too high because we end up in vortex ring state. We can't go too low because we then end up in, in, in the outwash regime. Similarly, we can't make our disk loading too low because then we end up in VRS, and we can't make it too high because then we, then we end up again in this outwash regime where we cause a tremendous amount of damage on the ground. So with nine seconds to go, my conclusions are that, okay, we know that eVTOL disk loadings may improve gust ride quality and all these sorts of things, but what happens in that case is that you end up reducing your gust margins with respect to VRS. We need to design our trajectories with local atmospheric conditions and appropriate margins against gust-induced entry into the VRS in mind. And aircraft designers might find themselves pushed into a very tight corner by vertiport design approaches that don't actually take the fundamental differences that are associated with eVTOL aerodynamics into account. There's room here for hand-in-hand -hand approaches where the uh, regulators and the designers come together to work, find workable solutions through this little channel, this, this rock and a hard place that I've, that I've actually designed in, into, into the diagram over there. And so globally, there is evidence to suggest that VRS for eVTOL aircraft will be as serious a problem as it is for helicopters. And I'd really hope that the eVTOL community, designers and regulators can learn from helicopter experience but realize that there are additional challenges which need to be addressed and additional features of the system which we need to look at uh, with the new technology to make sure that these vehicles are absolutely safe and are properly designed as far as some of these aerodynamic limitations are concerned. And I think as a final statement, it's, it's fair to say that eVTOL is presently perhaps just coming out of what we might call a honeymoon phase, where there's been a lot of, a lot of, a lot of very positive thought and a lot of um, uh, focus on, on, the, on the potential. But as we get real, as we start to bring these aircraft into service and flight testing and certification and all these sorts of things start to say, okay, that's what she really looks like when we wake up in the morning. I shouldn't have said that. Maybe that gong should have gone at that stage. But um, <laughs> maybe we start to see that there are a lot more pressing issues, all right? And we need to focus more on detailed, accurate, hardcore engineering approaches to this particular discipline so that these aircraft will do us proud and become part of the, the, the uh, transport environment in, in the sense that we, we really, I think at heart, all hope that they will become. So thank you very much. I'll stop there.